Hi everyone, it's Cassie Jordan here with TD Pipe Solutions um, Reline Live this week. I am joined by with Chris Hamilton from Avanti Grout. There, he's going to talk to us um, about their injection grouting. He's going to give us some really cool case studies. Um, Chris, do you want to tell anyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name's Chris. Uh, as she said, I cover the Northeast for Avanti. I, I do uh, 13 states, the original 13 from DC up to Maine. I've been with Avanti a uh, little over two years. Uh, came uh, came from the field industrial coatings background, uh, you know, and uh, been involved in many different types of projects. Uh, you know, all different types of scopes, all different types of projects, uh, basically for stabilizing soils and controlling water. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for joining me this week. I um I know you and I kind of played tag a little bit getting this schedule, but I'm really glad that you could make it with me. Um, so housekeeping for you guys real quick. I know some friendly faces on here that come every week and then I have a bunch of new people that I haven't seen registered. So welcome. We're glad to have you. There is a control panel on typically it's on the right side of your screen. There is a questions box. This is where Chris and I will be taking questions in real time and answering your questions as best we can. Um, I already have some questions that I know I want to ask Chris after getting a kind of a sneak peek at some of his slides. So with that, Chris, I'm going to let you um, take over and then I'll jump in when people ask questions. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So as I said before, uh, my name is Chris. I cover the Northeast for Avanti. Um, so I do a uh, DC to Maine. Of course, here's a picture of New York City, which is one of my uh, one of my target markets I deal in pretty frequently. So uh, probably to get started here. I thought I'd kind of go uh, with the basis of uh, kind of describe the product, kind of walk you through what they are. Uh, so what is an injection grout? Uh, it's a liquid solid that turns it in impermeable, uh, or liquid that resin that turns it in an impermeable solid within a given amount of time. We'll talk about the different types of products that can be influenced in the field, and we'll talk about kind of where they're used as we go through here. Um, so <clears throat> I like this slide uh, personally. Um, it fits for any type of underground infrastructure. So basically, uh, the process of failure on under, underground infrastructure as you have leaks. Um, the leaks will actually bring in soil from around around the structure into the area and causes voids. Uh, you can see here uh, on your um, on your type one, where you're starting to get the initial defect, you're starting to lose some soils. Uh, type two, you get uh, groundwater where you actually have the loss of the soil around, this, in this case, a pipe, which is causing the pipe to go out of alignment. You got no support for that pipe or no support for that underground infrastructure. You start to lose alignment or you start to sink, and that's where you... Uh, start to lose what you're either holding or you start to have even heavier infiltration. Uh, basically, and then you would get to your uh, step three here, which would be failure of the structure. Uh, typically, we get involved in uh, either step one or sometimes in step two, trying to be preventive, preventative for uh, preventing this from occurring. So as I said, um, the goals for injection grout, uh, grouts are stabilizing soils and rock and controlling water. So um, you're probably sitting there thinking, you know, where, where are these products used? Uh, as you can see here is actually a picture of a manhole. Uh, we actually uh, injected it and sealed with an epoxy afterwards. Um, our products are used heavily in uh, subways and tunnels. There's actually um, 10 major metro authorities in the U.S. We're in nine of them. Uh, for instance, here on the left, there's a train tunnel we were just doing some work in. On the right, it's a break-in for a tunnel that'll, that uh, we just did up in Connecticut. Uh, we do some work uh, kind of all over all over the U.S. in different types of tunnels. Uh, we're used heavily in mines and tailings dams. So uh, they actually will inject our product in mines to uh, prevent heavy seepage from coming in uh, down in the shafts uh, to, to prevent loss of materials. Uh, they'll inject our materials in pre-excavation to uh, prevent anything from caving in or to uh, stabilize the soils. Uh, and then uh, for uh, tailings dams, we'll actually inject our products to stabilize the soil so you don't lose it uh, due to seepage underneath the tailings dam. Uh, we use heavily in concrete and earthen dams. Here's a picture of the Hoover. Uh, they actually did, uh, one of our products was used when they were uh, putting one of the tunnels in. They actually uh, injected our product to stop high pressure water flows from coming into the area. Uh, we do a lot with uh, joints and uh, a lot of areas inside of dams where they have uh, infiltration, slight infiltration to injection, do small injection product projects. And uh, underground infrastructure, uh, so we do a lot in uh, electrical vaults, uh, conduits, uh, culverts, a uh, lot of different types of structures for stopping infiltration. And then um, a lot of our business is in uh, municipal, 
So we do a lot with uh, mainline and lateral sealing, uh, preventing water from coming through mainline joints, uh, lateral joints, uh, cracks in mainline pipe if it's not structural, and then uh, a lot inside of manholes for stopping infiltration from coming in through manholes. So as far as the different types of grouts, there are three main types. Uh, you would have your polyurethanes, which are split in two subcategories. You got hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Uh, chemically reactive products, which are full chemical reaction, don't need water to react. Uh, they're split into three subcategories. You got acrylamides, acrylates, and acrylics. And then you have ultrafine cement, which is a uh, super low viscosity um, cement, cementitious product used for stabilizing soils. So I'm as sure far as your polyurethane. Chris, oh, but I have a quick question. And you might yeah. you might be addressing this. Uh, where would you use the chemically reactive versus the poly polyurethane? So that's a good question. That's a really good question. So there's a number of different pl uh, places you would use a chemically reactive product versus the polyurethane. Uh, the chemically reactive products uh, are ultra thin in viscosity, so uh, almost the same viscosity as water. So when you get into uh, soil strata uh, that are extremely uh, tight or have a lot of fines. Uh, sugar sands, for instance, where you need something that's going to be able to flow through the small uh, small areas and permeate and lock everything together. Uh, and acrylate would do very well. The other thing that's nice about acrylates we'll talk about as I get there is you can actually control the set time and be able to pump that material on low pressure a lot further as well. So it, it has a lot of different usages versus the polyurethane, which is water activated and starts to react as soon as it hits water. So. Uh, Good question though, Cassie. Um, okay. as, as, far, as far as polyurethanes, uh, as I was starting here, um, they're, they're split in two subcategories. You got hydrophilics and hydrophobics. Your uh, hydrophilic products uh, need to be in a wet, damp environment at all time, um, and they react with water. Um, hydrophobics, on the other hand, need minimal amount of water to react. And once they react, they don't need water afterwards. Um, the nice thing about phobics, they do have a little bit more different expansion rates and with the catalyst you can actually adjust the set time in the field. So uh, Felix, as I said, are single component. They react with water. So as far as your reaction times, they're a little bit harder to modify. So if it's colder water, uh, we've been in situations where middle of winter in Connecticut takes material, you know, three and a half minutes to react. It'll still react, but it takes a lot longer. So it's a lot messier a little, little bit harder to work with. Uh, we have many of our products have potable water approvals. So if you need that on an application, uh, they have fair chemical resistance. The reason we say fair is hydrophilics actually have um, do what's called a post-reaction swell where they'll actually draw in moisture from the environment and they'll actually cause a little bit of a reaction afterwards. Um, since it is still drawing in moisture after it reacts, it'll continually draw on whatever chemical is in there. So over time, it'll start to break itself down. Um, at the bottom is just a few of our hydrophilic products that are the most popular. This is just a slide that kind of gives you an idea of how the hydrophilics work. So you got your resin, uh, you mix it with water. Uh, that reaction time can be anywhere from 30 seconds. Like I said, we've done up to three minutes uh, with really, really cold temperatures. Uh, and then the material expands and forms an impermeable, flexible barrier. Uh, all the hydrophilics expand four to six times volume and become like a rubbery kind of gaskety type material. Phobics, on the other hand, uh, can be a foam or solid. Uh, they have higher expansion. So they actually, uh, we have some of the products actually expand up to 40 times uh, their own volume. Uh, they're dual component, uh, but they don't react until they hit water. So basically they have a conditioner or catalyst that's added in uh, that affects the reaction time. Um, they can be flexible. Uh, semi-rigid or rigid. So uh, typically the higher expanding products have a little bit more rigidity to them. Uh, the reason being is when they mix with the, so with the soils, they become a lot harder and create a dense barrier around the outside of the structure. So they're used more for void fill soil stabilization around structures. Um, they can also be accelerated, so you can actually double the catalyst that's used in hydrophobic in most cases. And then uh, many of our hydrophobics do have potable water approvals and they have a little bit better chemical resistance because once they react, they don't draw that moisture in. So they basically react and they are what they are. So here's a couple of our most popular products, the 248, 275, 278, and 290. Here's just another show of how the hydrophobics react. This is actually our 290, which is a full chemical reaction product. 
It's our only one that doesn't need water in the hydrophobics besides the slab lifting foam. Uh, the two parts mix, and uh, within about 15 seconds, that material expands uh, 25 times its own volume and becomes a uh, uh, rigid foam that basically is used for void fill applications. So uh, as far as chemically reactive products, as I stated earlier, they're super low in viscosity. Um, the acrylamide, uh, which is uh, probably the most prevalently used product, um, is actually uh, used for typically for water control and soil stabilization um, type applications. It has a long design life and a long set time. So uh, this material was actually used to encapsulate nuclear waste. And uh, it was tested by the Department of Energy and they actually gave it a 362 year half-life to it at a 20% concentration. Um, the set times can be adjusted in the field. Uh, the nice thing about this material is you can actually set it off in eight seconds or you can actually slow that set time down to 15 hours. So if you need to pump it long distances or you need to flow through uh, thinner uh, soils or soils with a lot of fines, uh, you can slow the set time and allow it to permeate and travel to uh, lock those soils together. <clears throat> it has a manageable toxic component. Uh, it is an acrylamide base. Uh, so uh, uh, acrylamide is a known ca uh, cancer causing agent. However, uh, acrylamide is also a byproduct of baking bread, um, and also coffee, and a lot of different things that you're actually exposed to on a daily basis. Once the product is cured, it is non-toxic and irreversible. So it basically becomes a gel by itself. And uh, once it's in that state, it's completely uh, inert. Here's a picture of what that looks like. Uh, the material is typically clear. What they did here is they add dye packets to it in the fields to make sure it mixes on ratio. Uh, so it's just kind of showing it mixing on ratio and you can see when it's done, it's a gel, it stands by itself and it's non-toxic and it's used for water control. So Chris, when you're, sh you're, so you're showing us these different products, how, what equipment yep. do you need to actually get these products out there in, i mean and whether it's injection or like you showed a couple where they're actually putting it it looks like on a wall like what's the equipment that you would use for that is it similar yeah. to what we're used to like an actual grout pump or is it totally different so the uh the polyurethanes that i started with um they are typically applied through a small airless paint sprayer kind of like they like you would see a house paint guy using okay uh, they would actually uh use that uh, that'll pump the material and they would have injection zerks that they would install and they'd be able to pump it that way. Um, the chemically reactive products are uh, need a plural component. So they're drawing at a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and it has to be stainless steel because there's a, the uh, catalyst is an oxidizer. Uh, and basically it would come down to a mixing block where the two parts meet and then it would be injected that way. Um, but this product would actually be mixed very similar to what you're, what you're used to. Uh, this would be our actual cementitious products. So um, okay, where so uh, kind of this is going to be kind of changing up a little bit. So as far as the cement and cementitious type products, typically the ones we see for what we're trying to do for soil type permeation, permeation grouting, locking soils together, typically you see a type three uh, Portland cement, um, which you can see there. Your average micron is 15 to 20, um, or you would see a cementitious type product, uh, kind of like our ultrafine, uh, where you, you could get material down to three microns. Uh, so just a little bit of an idea of kind of the scope of that. So one human hair is actually 60 microns. So you can see how small the the size of the material is and, and kind of how, how it makes it so it can flow into smaller areas and tighter soil matrices. This here is actually just a uh, picture um, this actually shows the difference between the type three and the ultrafine as far as the way it travels through soil. So these are actually both filled with 30 mesh Ottawa sand. They injected them under the same pressure. You can see on the left, what happened was um, with it being a, a bigger micron material, the product couldn't permeate. So build a dam and the material couldn't flow up. On the right hand side, you can see that the, uh, the uh, ultra fine product was able to flow through the soils all the way up to the top and lock all that soil together. So kind of what would be, an idea. yeah, what would be, when would, again, when would you use one versus the other? So uh, it would be just, it would depend on soil types. So um, uh, typically where um, our ultra fine type products are used are in uh, sandier 
type soils, uh, uh, soils that uh, basically you're, 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 we're basically trying to form cohesion and non-cohesive soils. So it'd be sandier type soils where you need something where a typical cement will not flow into that area. Gotcha. Or okay. The other place, the other place these are used are typically in rock fractures. So if you get into really small rock fractures, um, uh, our ultrafine can actually travel into rock fractures as small as seven microns. So extremely tight rock fractures and seal them to prevent high pressure water from flowing in. That's cool. Okay. So I'm going to walk through a couple case histories I thought would be kind of applicable to the audience here. Um, the first one is actually, uh, we did it, this job was actually done uh, for the DEP. Um, they actually had uh, up to uh, about 2 million gallons a day coming in through the bottom of the pipe. You can actually see in the middle picture here where the two guys are actually reaching down into the water. They're actually trying to find exactly the area where the, where the, where the water was coming in. And basically what they did was they built a cap and injected a low viscosity, high expansion foam to the backside to build a barrier to prevent that, that water from coming in. So once they actually stopped it, what happened was the water pressure built up and they ended up having to inject all the walls. So you can see here where they're actually working their way up the walls of the structure. And on the right hand side, you can actually just kind of see as they walk down the tunnel and sealed all those walls and stopped the infiltration from coming in. So this, this tunnel was actually large enough you could actually drive uh, cars through it. It's actually a sewer system. This project was actually, a, uh, this is actually a really cool one, uh, helped the design with PSEG. It's actually a case history on our website and actually was up for underground trenches uh, project of the year at one point. Um, oh, cool. They had a, yeah, it was really cool. They had a 43 inch gas main that went under the New Jersey Turnpike and they were concerned uh, they didn't want to have to dig the pipe up because they were having infiltration into the pipe. Um, and they, so they wanted to stop that infiltration so they could line it and keep the pipe in service. Uh, so I helped uh, PSDG kind of come up with a game plan. And uh, my customer uh, actually uh, built a little kind of like scaffold or a little bit kind of like a skateboard type system and uh, mounted his guy to a skateboard. And uh, the pipe went out down at a 45 degree angle out again and then down to the 60. So they actually had to uh, wheel the guy down on a pulley system they made. Um, and he had to actually drill through the metal pipe, uh, insert, install the Zerks and inject uh, material, uh, polyurethane to the outside of the pipe to lock all the soils together and create impermeable matrix around the pipe so that it would stop the water from coming in. So they actually sealed that and then lined it with a CIPP liner afterwards. So you and I were kind of talking about that before we um, kicked off Reline Live, because my background is uh, heavily in, in slip lining or spray liners. When would this be a good option? Because we were kind of talking about a snap type project, right? Yep. Now, are yeah. Gonna, so go ahead. Tell me how okay. they're going to use it. I'm curious on that one. You and Don said you were working on that project. Yeah. So a project I'm working on right now, they're actually putting in a tunnel. Um, it's a medium diameter, about 60 inch diameter tunnel. And they have uh, about 2000 joints. Um, the, uh, the joints, they're having infiltration through the joints and there's a uh, basically a system in there um, that is a hydraulic system that basically they wanna seal so that the water doesn't come through, but they wanted to put something over the joints so that it would stay flexible. So um, kind of the game plan we're considering is using uh, snap tight product over the joints and mounting ports into the snap tight. So you could inject a low viscosity, uh, high expansion foam to the outside of the joint, have it lock the soils together and build a barrier in there, prevent the water from coming in. And then they'd have a flexible joint and then the joint would be stabilized or the area would be stabilized and they wouldn't have to worry about water coming in. That's really and that's cool. Actually, yeah, and that's actually how I got in contact originally with, with Don was actually, uh, we both did a presentation at TRB this past year, and uh, we discussed that application for culvert, culverts. Yeah. Because um, we, we feel like that's, uh, you know, thinking about it logically, it's kind of a, uh, um, kind of a nuts, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the full scope, you know, you're trying to stabilize it so you don't have it happen in the future or have anything happen in the future, which causes further erosion. 
So that's kind of the idea of uh, what we're what we've been talking about with the snap type type product. Cool. All right. Thanks. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> this was actually a really cool project to just commit, completed actually about a, about a month and a half ago. It's actually going to be in uh, New England Construction Magazine uh, next actually this month coming. Um, they actually were uh, putting in a medium diameter. I believe it's a 54 inch diameter pipe and uh, what was happening was they had a lot of uh, siltier sands on the outside of this pipe or where this pipe was supposed to be driven through they were concerned when they started to drive the pipe that the, that vibration would cause those soils to basically collapse down and they would lose their lose the soils and then create a void so what they did was they actually um, burned a hole in the sheeting and drove pipes through the sheeting and pumped uh, our acrylamide product out in the soil and built an impermeable matrix in the soil and then pushed the pipe through the acrylamide in the soil. So um, the, the material in the soil will get you about anywhere from about 40 PSI up to 100 PSI. Um, the contractor said that when they did it, uh, it, it held up, did a very good job. And actually they said they, they're, they're putting it in a job or in, construction magazine right now for next month. This is probably one of the coolest projects I've ever done. Uh, this is actually uh, that ladder right there on the left is actually 45 feet down. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very large uh, drinking water reservoir. Uh, this thing actually held uh, 17 and a half million gallons of water and their issue was uh, multiple issues they had. Uh, the main one being originally was all the joints on the ceiling. You can kind of see it. If you look to the left of some of the support beams there, you can see the dark staining. Uh, they had groundwater infiltration coming in through the joints, which was leaching down into the drinking water reservoir. So they needed to seal those joints. So as you can see, the contractor had to drop scaffolding down piece by piece. And uh, we helped him, uh, helped him, uh, getting set up on this job and they actually injected the joints all the way across inside the structure. And then on the bottom right hand side, you can actually see there was an incline on the one side and they actually had water spraying through the incline from the groundwater pressure. Mm -hmm. So we actually curtain grouted uh, the incline uh, to create a, a barrier on the outside to prevent the water from coming through. Uh, both the products were potable water approved and then they actually shock created that incline after we were done sealing it. I was just going to ask if that was potable water approved. Cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times we use the head of coatings or a head of a shock creek type application, especially in tunneling and underground infrastructure. We get kind of used as the first step. Uh, so make sure that you get proper adhesion to the, to the substrate. Um, with that, I'm kind of I'm kind of through some of the different case histories. Um, I mean, I'm I'm willing to answer any questions, anything anybody might have. Um, okay, so do you have a couple questions here? Um, what kind of training do you guys offer? Is there any sort of certification program? So uh, we have four reps throughout the country. Um, we we do uh, we do often do a lot of uh, in shop training with customers, and we also will do uh, we've been on job sites and we do assist with that. Uh, so we do we do a lot of hand we're, we're all hands on, so we're all willing to uh, go into a tunnel, go into a structure of any any type, and help somebody get set up and get comfortable with the products and how they're used. So once you've done the training, though, they can just buy the product and install it themselves. It can be self performed. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, so we've we've trained municipalities on doing, you know, small uh you know, those so I, I have some municipalities in my territory that'll actually uh grout manholes by themselves. I have other ones that'll um you know, they'll sub that kind of work and they'll do smaller projects like a pipe penetration coming through a wall or uh, replacing a link seal or something like that that's a little bit less equipment, less involved. Uh they'll do that kind of stuff themselves and then sub the larger work to a contractor if need be. Okay. So do you guys send someone out? Um, can you read this question? Oh yeah. Okay. So do you guys send someone out for like re reviewing a project? Like, I mean, I'm, uh, this is the first I've really been exposed to your product. So 
if I'm looking at a job and I think, oh, this might be the right pro project for Avanti, but I don't know, I don't know which one to recommend. Will you guys send someone out, walk through the project and then recommend a product and say, this is the, this is the grout you would need to fix this? Yeah, yeah, we do we do site assessments. All of our all of our reps would come out to a job site and help you get the right products in your hands, uh, and and help you know help kind of come over the game plan at least get you started on a job. Okay. So yeah, that's that's I'm actually heading out on Monday to go down into a tunnel to do to do that exactly that ap application. So, um, what DOT approvals do you have? So uh, our product is typically a special exemption for DOT applications. The reason, the reason being is there's so many different products and different types of applications that typically on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, so um, sometimes what happens is um, where our products have used, been for, uh, used, for instance, they'll do uh, crack injection. They're doing it on a bridge abutment right now in, uh, in New York. And uh, we had to get, uh, it was, it was a case by case pro, uh, process, so we had to get a product uh, approved for that job, a flexible material. I've done uh, some uh, some culvert work in Pennsylvania where we've had to get uh, products approved, kind of case by case. It's, it, it, it's hard to, uh, like I said, it's a more of a special exemption type application. Okay. I was curious about that too, so I'm glad somebody asked that question. Um, yeah. Yeah, we've we've done plenty of DOT applications. It's just it's it's all kind of case by case. Yeah, because I mean, in in our world, especially with the pipe material, we almost always have to be on a QPL um, for them yeah. to consider, especially states like California and New York, who are very tough to get uh, products approved. So. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Chris and I will hang out for a minute. If you guys want to type anything in, otherwise. This is probably the most on-time Reline Live I have ever done, which is amazing, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was like, trying to make sure that I did the 30 minutes. I didn't want to go too far over. <laughs> I know, your slide timing was fantastic. <laughs> um, oh, you practice it once or twice, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wing it with Reline Live, but there's been times when, especially with grout being such a hot topic, um, yeah. Dawn and I went an hour once and we didn't lose, I mean, we maybe lost two people, but it was like, there were so many questions. <laughs> so, um, I think, I think we're, I think it's kind of a newer application for, um, kind of, a, it's like a crossover between what you guys typically do and kind yeah. of, uh, something kind of newer for you because we, we, it, where me and Dawn kind of met is there's a lot of crossover. And and we kind of we've been see we both saw it and we both saw the opportunity. That's kind of how we started working together. So yeah, no, I think it's great. This is um this is a really interesting product. We actually one of uh, the DOT reps that I work with. Uh, I'll give a shout out to Blaine. He's on the call and he even said he's like such a neat solution. He's like there's just so much out there that you don't know about until you attend stuff like this, right? So, yeah. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, my contact information's right there. Uh, feel free. Give me a call. Shoot me an email. Text me. Whichever, yep. uh, whichever is most comfortable for you. Yeah. If you um, guys want a copy of this slide, I'll put Chris's information in the follow-up email that goes out with your certificates for attending tomorrow, and then you can ping him and just ask him for a copy of this presentation as well. If anybody wants it. Well, thank you. I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, Blaine said that'll be great. Okay, so he wants a copy of the presentation. <laughs> Um, okay. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it. I know I will be talking to you and your team uh, again next week, probably. So appreciate yep. your time today. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you, guys. Have a good afternoon. Bye, guys.